I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing change makers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Michaela Loach is a climate justice activist, a podcaster, a writer, and a fourth-year medical student based in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2020, Forbes Global Citizen and BBC Woman's Hour named Michaela as one of the most influential women in the UK climate movement. Her work focuses on making the climate movement more inclusive and focusing on the intersections of the climate crisis with oppressive systems such as white supremacy and migrant injustices. Her activism has been featured in the BBC, Vogue, Cosmopolitan, Elle and Vice. She uses her Instagram platform and her podcast, The Yikes Podcast, to communicate the need for system change, climate justice, and dismantling white supremacy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Good Ancestor Podcast. I'm your host, Leila Saad, and I'm here with an, a guest that I'm very excited to speak with today. I'm here with Michaela Loach. Welcome, Michaela. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. I am so excited to speak to you. Um, just before we hit record, I was saying uh, we've had quite a day here. I know Sarita, our podcast manager, has had quite a day. And, you know, knowing that um, this conversation with you was happening today was the highlight of our day. And I'm sure that for so many of our listeners, that it's going to be a highlight for them, for sure. Uh, so welcome. Oh, wow. That's like quite a high bar to set. But I, <laughs> I, hope that, um, I hope I can try and like meet some of that expectation. I'm sure you will. I've been uh, diving deep into some of your interviews and conversations and of course your podcast as well. And you're just such a thrill to listen to. So, so let's dive right in. Um, okay. So our first question, who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned familial or societal who have influenced you on your journey? That is such a huge question. And yes. like when I've listened to the podcast before, I'm always like, what would I say? And then now I'm here. <laughs> You're um, here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are there are obviously so many people and ancestors who have impacted me in so many ways. Like I think if we think familiarly, like my my mum is a huge influence on my life in so many ways. And we have a really great relationship. Um, and just like the women actually in my life, especially like the women in the Jamaican side of my family, like I just see them as such a strong influence in all that I am today and um, before we were recording I even said how I, I called my mom when I got um, the email about coming on this podcast and I called my grandma as well to talk to them about our family and especially the mm. Jamaican side of my family um, because I think I think growing up in in the UK um, in a very white context I kind of clung to um, my Jamaican side quite a lot because I didn't really have that many other black people around me or that many other Jamaican people around me um, so I would cling to like my actual family, like my mom and my grandma and things, but also to our history and people like Nanny of the Maroons, who was a freedom fighter in Jamaica. Like I would really, I'd always like watch documentaries about her and learn about her. And I'd kind of, I think I see in, in Jamaica, there's this, um, kind of the motto of Jamaica is, um, out of many one people. Mm. So I think I look through kind of historical freedom fighters in Jamaica and I see them as my ancestors too and them as connected to me um and so I think that I've just been this is a very broad answer but I think I'm I've been impacted in so many ways by all of the kind of Jamaican freedom fighters that have come before me mm. um but especially like the women in my life a lot yeah definitely the women in my family a lot oh I love that it kind of reminds me you're making me um think about um when uh, Amanda Gorman gave her speech at the um, uh, inauguration um, and I went back afterwards and sort of listened to some of her interviews and she talked about a mantra that she says before she does any speaking engagement anytime she stands up in front of a crowd and she's like you know I'm, I'm the daughter of black 
writers. Like mm. I come from all of them. So yes, uh, and she too speaks about her mother and her mother's huge influence in her life, but also recognizing like I belong, belong to all of these people. Like I carry them with me. Um, they're in, they're in me and I'm in them, mm. you know, and that's what I, that's what you shared made me think about. Yeah. And I think that's something that's always impacted me throughout my life. Um, because my parents were very keen for me to be aware of my Jamaican heritage and where I came from and kind of just that whole part of me. And I think in many ways, I don't know how to describe this that well, but I, I like, I remember when I was revising for my exams or doing things in life, I would write down like women that I knew or people that I knew who were my ancestors in some way that were, that were black individuals who were kind of harmed and oppressed by these systems. I'd write, I'd, I'd almost like guide the work that I was doing towards them and realize that I was doing that because of these people who came before me that fought for why everything that I have today and I I think I grapple a lot with that now because I'm like how much was I like was I beating like my 12 year old self up almost well. about <laughs> <laughs> like to be like study because all of these things came before you but in many ways it was also like this almost like connection that I felt with these mm-hmm. these people who came before me as well Yeah, that's, I find that really interesting because obviously we have different ethnic backgrounds, but I also grew up in the UK in predominantly, you know, white um, areas and the people who I knew who were from, who were black basically were my family. So obviously my parents, my brothers, Mm -hmm. but also uncle, a couple of uncles and aunts and cousins. And that was about it. Right. And so that is the context that you understand. And it's, it's so, um, strange you know seeing yourself only reflected in a small sector of people but also knowing that you're not really from there or there's this other part of you that's from somewhere else but you don't necessarily know what it's like there or Mm. haven't grown up there you don't have that connection there Um, and it sounds almost like that was you yearning to like keep that connection alive and know that this is a part of me and you know I I think as I mean you just saying like my 12 year old self, like putting that much pressure on myself and having those thoughts. But I also think it's very powerful. Um, and probably, you know, some people might say, Oh, you, you know, you're only 22 years old. Like you're doing quite a lot. You should be focused on this instead of leave that to other people. But it's like, no, like this is the path that you're supposed to be on. No one's too young to start, um, to care right about Mm. the world. Um, but it was probably, you know, a foretelling of what was coming, right. That that Mm -hmm. was so strong in you that you were so aware and so conscious. And so I'm really interested to know, like, what were the seeds that were planted that got you thinking in that way? Because I know where I was, even at 22, I was a hot mess. (laughs) 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 I'm definitely a late bloomer. Um, I was always, I think like you, you talked about in an interview, I saw that you said you were very, always like a goody two shoes, Mm -hmm. do really well in exams and all of that. That was me too. But I, I didn't know who I was or what I was doing until much more recently in my life, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, So tell us about your journey. Yeah, so I think that a lot of um, me starting to care really deeply about issues and wanting to do something about it, I definitely think it came from my parents encouraging me to kind of be who I am, if that makes sense. So my dad, especially, I remember from a really young age, um, I'd watched loads of, I think I'd happened to watch loads of documentaries about Jamaican history and especially about um, like the slave rights in Jamaica and um, Nanny of the Maroons and all these different kind of people who would um, rise up against oppression. I remember watching these things and I think I turned to my dad and I was like, 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 can I, can I also do stuff like that now? Like there, there's, there's injustice that's happening now. Like, what can I do about it? And he was just like, you can do anything that you want to, like you should do anything that you want to and you should. And there's, and I was like, okay, I guess I have to wait until I'm 18 he was like why would you wait like you can do things now wow. what do you see in front of you that is a problem and what, and what could you do about it now and I think he always and I spent both my parents actually always never well they never made out to me that there was a limit to how much we could do or how much that we could care or how much or that we had to be a certain age in order to take action on an issue so like for example when I wanted to go to Calais to volunteer when I saw on the news about the refugee crisis um 
I say refugee crisis in quotation marks because it's mm. a crisis of empathy rather than the individuals themselves and not mm. the crisis. Um, but when I saw that in the news, the first thing that like I, people that I'd interact with most would be probably my parents, especially growing up. And they'd just be like, hey, so what do you want to do about it? Like, do you want to go? Um, and, and if you want to go, like, how are you going to make that happen? And they'd be the ones who kind of were constantly encouraging me to act on these things they themselves um would definitely not identify as activists or don't do I was this gonna work. ask like, yeah, they no. have an activist past is this like, like yeah where, no right wow so that's what's quite funny about this because I think a lot of the other people I know so I see myself as like a a late bloomer to this stuff more because now I'm surrounded by a lot of people who their parents took them to marches when they were super young and they've mm. been part of all this stuff for so long whereas like my mum is a computer scientist and my dad works in finance and stuff like they're both very like professional people who have not been involved in um, activism or protests or things like that actually we as a family went to our first protest as a family um to the Black Lives Matter protest in London in the summer during the pandemic wow. and that was a really moving moment because it was my little brother my mum and my dad and all of us together and they were like we're glad that we can be part of your life in this way because wow. this they saw that um and it was really kind of a moving thing um but I do think that like it was just more like I'd see something in the news and my parents and I'd say like oh I, and I'd be really moved by it and then they'd just kind of be like so what are you going to do about it and that would be whether I was six years old and did a bake sale at school to raise money for um, a natural disaster that happened or whether it was a different time in my life when I was at school and I'd give speeches and be labeled as this weirdo who <laughs> cared too much about stuff um it was all these different things but I definitely think it was my parents who encouraged me um a lot and didn't restrict me and just kind of let me be who I was um and yeah because I think at school all of us are kind of taught that oppression is something of the past and thankfully right. everyone else fought it fought these battles and yeah. won them for us and we don't need to do anything um but I think I was just very aware of how that was just not true um and how there was still there were still things that we could fight for now and yeah I think it's a mix of things of there was a time in my life when I was quite young that I remember it was really strange I don't think I've talked about this before but I felt weirdly almost guilty that other people had had to fight these fights for black liberation before me and that I was able to experience um many freedoms now like I felt I remember being quite young and feeling really genuinely guilty about it because I was like I haven't done anything to deserve the space where I'm in now wow. and then I think I reflected a lot and I was like you, one you don't have to deserve freedom and and happiness like that shouldn't be something that you should have to you have to fight for but two, there are still things you can fight for now and you can be part of liberation still. Um, and that can be a beautiful kind of like, I think of it as this like kind of history of passing down mm. struggle and liberation and fighting for that together. And that's almost this like generational, beautiful thing that you can do. Um, mm. um, so yeah, I think it's like, it's been, a, it's been a mix of things, but I do think that my parents, why then that they themselves are not activists and why they have not don't really go I think to marches and things amazing, like that. Yeah. Though. I think it's so amazing. And it's, I mean, as a parent, I also find it really inspiring because um, you know, I don't um personally identify as an activist. Um, I am a writer and I teach and speak. Um, but I know that I talk about these issues a lot to my children, and I had never thought, what if one day my kids say <laughs> I want to go do something. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of processing this out loud, but I think my parent instinct would, would kick in and be like, oh, no, 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 I have to like protect you from that. When you're older, you can do that. But I mm. see how amazing it is um, that your parents didn't do that. And while obviously still, you know, being your parents and taking care of you, but they encouraged you to be thinking about you know, the voice that you do have, the acts that you can do, like the power that you, you can use. Um, and I think that's, that's really amazing. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you to your parents for that, <laughs> for that lesson. I, and I think the, the parenting <laughs> way they would do it is they'd be like, do it with some friends. <laughs> right. And but they, but they, the way they communicate that to me was like, imagine if you brought fret you brought friends with you and that would make it even better and you'd reach more people. Right. And I realized now like that was them just being like, don't let her do this alone. Or it'd be like, my mum came to Calais with me the first time they went to volunteer, um, mm. which was actually really lovely as well. And then my whole family went out to Calais together to volunteer. I think sometimes like they would be like, do these things, but do it with other people. Yeah. <laughs> which actually was really nice. I, and, and that is, you know, 
this work of being in, in social justice work um, isn't about being the, the lone person doing it mm. alone, right? It is about community. It is about togetherness. Um, talk a little bit about that and about how, um, you know, because this journey is very tough. Um, I've heard you talk in another interview about the sense of sort of anxiety that you felt at um, climate change, climate mm-hmm. injustice, the ref- refugee crisis in, in uh, you know, in commas. Um, t- talk a little bit about the anxiety and how community has helped you with that. Mm. Yeah, I think that bringing people with you is the most important part of doing kind of any social change work and doing it in community is the most important part. And this is something that I've been really finding really difficult during the pandemic. And I'm sure that other people have found this difficult because we're all kind of separate from each other in many ways. And I and what I really miss is is that togetherness of of doing things together. Because the reality is, is while social media and whilst the press and the media and everything will be like, oh, look at this one amazing person who's created change. Right. right. That's just not the reality. It's like change is created by a lot of people doing doing stuff it's not about one leader or one person I often think that leaders are kind of very problematic in the way that if you are putting all of your movement onto one person and it's all about that one person that one person is a human being they are like they like they're not infallible they're gonna make mistakes and that means that our movements will be as fragile as that one individual is if we put all the kind of emphasis on that whereas if you put if a movement is about individuals, it's about a huge, a huge amount of individuals together as a collective, um, then it's much harder to break that down. Um, it's, that's not as fragile. Like that's a way that we can support each other. That's a way that we can have longevity as well. Um, mm. I just think that kind of collectivism is so important and it's, and it's important that we focus on that in this age of individualism, in this age of glorifying and putting on the pedestal one person. Um, and I'm definitely included in that. I really worry sometimes about how my work on social media, especially, mm. um, might feed into this idea of individualism and it being about me when actually it shouldn't be about me. It should be about the movement. And especially when it comes to something as important as climate justice and something as important as um, racial justice and all the different things that are something that we need, that they're issues that we need to have long, that we need to be able to fight for the long haul. And mm. um, we can't have that be about an individual um at all um and kind of when we're in the collective when we're in community that's when I also see hope which is why I really miss being together because um there's a quote by Aaron Dutty Roy that I will be paraphrasing here because sometimes I get a bit wrong but um it's basically saying that another world is on her way and on a quiet day I can hear her breathing okay, okay and, say, say, say it again real slow yeah another world is on her way and on a quiet day I can hear her breathing Mm. and I always like that's something that I kind of hold really close to my heart that that kind of quote from Aaron Dutcher I think is an amazing um intellectual and thinker and resistor and just an amazing human being whilst not trying to glorify her I think the way that she communicates things is really beautiful um but I hold that close to me to be because I try and think when can I hear this new world breathe because I think that we see glimpses of this new world that we're moving towards this future that we want to be better. Mm -hmm. And for me, I hear that new world breathe, not when there's like one amazing individual who seems to be succeeding in things or whatever. I hear that new world breathe when we're in community together and we're allowed to be fully human and fully human means supporting each other and fully human means not being perfect. And it was, but it just means loving each other enough to want to move towards this future together. Um, And that's why I think that we need to really move away from this individualism or this individual idea or this idea of yeah, exceptional individuals being the cause for change. Because even if we look through history, yeah, the news or the history books might tell us that, for example, the civil rights movement was just Martin Luther King Jr. or it was just Malcolm X or things like that. But actually, it was about so many individuals who will never know their names ever, That's who right. did, who really put their like their their lives on the line um Mm. who names of people who have lost their lives who will never know Mm. um and when I apply this to the climate crisis I always like think about indigenous communities who are protecting the majority of the world and the biodiversity of the world for us they're protecting um for the whole of humanity because they have no choice and these are people who are doing much more climate work than I am or much more climate work than any of these names that you might know um and people who will have lost their lives and yet you you might not know their names and you will never probably know a lot of these people's names um 
And that doesn't mean that their work isn't valuable. And so I think that's why we need to kind of move away from this glorification of an individual instead be like, how can we be in community? How can we support each other in community? And how can we um, have a collective struggle rather than an individual kind of struggle? That is, um, thank you for that, because it's incredibly humbling, especially what you said about, you know, the, the, the people, majority of the people who are doing the work um, that will be the work that, you know, is the bulk of what, you know, it protects the, the the environment, protects the planet. We may not know their names. We may not know. Um, we may never see them on Instagram, right? We may never, mm. <laughs> right? But they are. But they are doing the work. And I think that there is, and this is something that I really struggle with with social media, which is why I have, I'm continuing to evolve my relationship with it. Um, you know, sort of exploring digital minimalism and other ways of sort of decentering myself as um, a, a person that people look to as one of those people, one of those public figures, and really trying to just push the work forward and let the work mm -hmm. um, speak for itself. But I think that we, as a collective, with it, it, you know, capitalism is this very individualistic. Um, uh, philosophy has this very individualistic way of being. And I think sometimes we want to name certain people as our quote unquote heroes, because it, it kind of excuses us from having to do the work. Um, if we can just say, well, she's taking care of that. Well, that's what they do. Um, so I don't need to do it. It kind of excuses us from having to take responsibility and do our part. And our part doesn't have to be stand up and give a speech, be on TV. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that. But there are things that can be done that need to be done. And we don't get to be excused out of them just because someone else is more public doing it. Mm. Um, what do you What do you think of that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? I think that's a really interesting way to put it as well. Cause I've, I actually haven't thought of it that way that people almost excuse themselves from having to do the work themselves cause they'll see someone else. Um, I also think that another part of it is that people don't feel like they can do the work because they're like, oh, the work is only public facing stuff. Like the yes. work is only, like being able to be a good public speaker or that work is only doing TV interviews or things like that. When actually that's such a small, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage right. of the work. Um, right. And so many other things are so important. I think that, th and this is another issue I think I see with this kind of with as much, I think I obviously think social media can be a good thing. Otherwise I wouldn't use it. Right. Um, right. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't yeah. know each other if not for social media. Yeah, exactly. Right. There, right. And there are so many like wonderful, wonderful things that, have come out of social media there's so many movements that I've learned about and been able to support and things like that through social media I think that it can be really useful but I think people would just make sure they're taking a critical like eye to it and realize everything this is just like a surface level of stuff because when the actual work a lot of it is really boring it's like three hour long zoom calls where you're listening to I think I think it's boring but beautiful how you'll have a three hour long zoom call with, with people who you've never met maybe and you'll be chatting to them about how can we push this movement forward how can we do this this and this and we'll, you'll be delegating tasks and it's like a lot of the work sometimes I kind of try to, to tell people that activism or organizing it's kind of like if you want to run an event say that you want to right. run a gala of something you right. need some people who just print off posters and that's all their job is is just to make sure they have they take a couple hours to print off a load of posters there's some people who put up the posters there's some people who are like the emotional support for people who are doing a lot of the work and like just want to support people that way there are the the speakers and the educators and and those kind of more public facing people but there are people that also just get other people to do stuff like they're really good at organizing people or they're people who do who work out who work out the finances to make this event happen like right. there are all these different jobs that that come into making a movement but people only focus on like the the really public facing stuff right. um when actually whoever you are whoever you are listening to this you will have skills that are really useful to social change and for movements and they don't have to be glamorous or exciting they could just be whatever you're good at and then that will be useful in some way whether you're creative or you're just good with like money or things like that like there are loads of different jobs that I think people just don't see um, and then they think well I'm not uh, I'm not an MLK I'm not an Andrew Davis therefore I can't do any of these things and actually we need loads of as many people as possible to care and to do stuff. 
Absolutely. Oh, I love this discussion. Thank you, Michaela. Um, I think this is so helpful to so many people. You know, um, when I write to our readers, I talk a lot about like when I say good ancestor, what I actually mean. And, mm. you know, yes, there are those figures that we've identified. Yes. And even the people that we interview on this podcast who are public figures or who are um, recognized publicly, but all of us um, are will be ancestors, right? All of us are living mm. ancestors and all of us will have an impact in the world and we get to choose what that impact will be. And it doesn't have to be this huge, big thing. Um, mm. But we we don't realize, I think, the ripple effect that things that we take for granted, like our natural skills, right? So you used the example of someone who may be very creative, right? So maybe they do the social media or the website, mm. right? Or the posters or whatever it is, but they don't realize the ripple effect that something that just comes so easy to them can have um, for so many people. And so it's so important for us not to be sort of looking around, comparing ourselves to other people and saying, you know, I was saying when I was 22, I was a hot mess, right? Like, okay, that's my journey. right? <laughs> And that's not to say Michaela's not a hot mess, right? Adam? Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel yeah, no, like no, you no, are, but, but you know. No, can, no, 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 no. I know. think this is another thing is that because social media is like, obviously anyone that you're following, you're seeing the curated parts of someone's that's life. That's right. Like, and when I'm I was not 22, gonna... we didn't have social media, right? Because so... <laughs> I always think that because people are always like, wow, you just have it all together. And I like have burst out laughing sometimes like it is because I'm just like no I don't you <laughs> don't see the like the times when my period makes me just cry about videos of pigs and random stuff and then I can't do anything for a day because I'm like the pig was too cute like I, like I can't I'm just like also just a huge mess of a human being but I just I'm not going to put out all the messy bits right because otherwise my Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to create a, as much change as I think I can because everyone would be like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> what is all of this? What's happening? Like, what is um, this? No, but, but you're right, you know, and and so we, sh we don't need to be comparing ourselves to anybody else. We don't need to be thinking, oh, it, it my activism or my advocacy work needs to look like this. It needs to be packaged like that because then it, again, becomes about the individual mm -hmm. and not about the work, the movement. Um, and I just, I know you're so passionate about that. I've seen you um, talk about, um, I, I believe you received some awards, la was it last year? Yeah, which I found so weird. Yeah, so tell like us about that. <laughs> tell us what the awards are and how it made you feel. Um, I'm going to try, well, I want to, so I think I got, I think, lol, um, I, I I got nominated for a Global Citizen UK Hero Award, which I was like, what? <laughs> um, and then I was on the BBC Women's Hours power list as well. And there are a few other things I actually now can't remember, which is quite bad. Um, but I remember when I got them through, I was like really excited because I was like, wow, how do these people even know who I am? <laughs> um, but also then I was like, but I'm not doing the most work at all and I kind of I kind of felt a bit weirdly guilty again because I was like oh dear I'm taking up too much space like mm. the fact that me as an individual is being given these opportunities or these different things um I was like oh gosh I'm taking up too much space I'm definitely not doing the most work and then I realized that like these kind of awards they're just symbolic and and I am also in myself I'm also just like I just see that as I am representing every woman of color or every black woman who does this work and it they may they may be like oh we're giving this to Michaela Loach but all that means is that I am just representing these kind of other people who are doing these work as well it's not just about me mm. and actually for the for the women's hour one um I hope that Fahana wouldn't mind me saying this but Fahana Yamin who is an amazing um like climate scientist and lawyer and just maybe she's not a scientist she's a cl climate advocacy person and amazing lawyer who's been in the climate movement for so so long and she was also nominated for this um she was also put on this woman's hour power list as well as a climate list and as part of it we had a conversation um and I talked to her about I was like I actually feel kind of conflicted because mm. there are so many other people who have done this work and she said kind of the same thing to me that she was like we're just kind of representing all these other women of color who've been doing this work for so long it's not just about us mm. um, but it's about seeing people like us in the movement and giving us visibility people like us visibility in the movement um 
And I think that that's like when I, I think I just need to make sure that I check myself a lot on these things and check my ego all the time. Because yeah. when I did get some of these th- things for you, through, I'm not going to lie, like part of my brain was like, wow, I am amazing. I am the best. <laughs> activists yeah. in the world <laughs> yeah and, and like and how how cringe she would think like the best actress in the world like but I did yeah like I did think I think part like immediately your brain response oh absolutely is right? just to be like right. I am great mm-hmm. um but then if we can't like allow ego to come into these spaces because then we're never going to be able to create the best change ever because if I start thinking that I am the best and I know how to do everything in the best way then I'm going to not kind of I'm not going to be able to listen to other people's voices in the same way. Like the way that I create solutions or do my work, I won't be being influenced in the way that I need to be by people who have very different lived experiences than me, Mm -hmm. by people who have different intersectional oppressions than me, because I recognize that whilst I am racialized as a black woman in the UK, I'm also mixed race. So I'm very light skinned. And I also have privilege in so many different ways. Like I have light skin privilege. I'm in like a, I'm in higher education. That's privilege. I have loads of different privileges and so I think I just need to make sure and I do try and make sure that I am checking myself because I mean this kind of feeds into online things as well because you can end up going down this this rabbit hole and losing yourself I feel with these kind of things and this is something that I actually recently this weekend I made a big decision about about a thing it was like a kind of some paid work that I was being offered and it was a lot of a lot of money for me I hope is not more than I'd ever been offered for something and I was so close to doing it and then I checked myself on the weekend and I was like you're the only reason I would have been doing it was just for the money mm. and actually it was if I if I was being realistic with myself it was a greenwashing campaign completely mm. and whilst it would be like easy work and whilst it wouldn't be quote unquote that bad and whilst a lot of my friends were like no one would blame you for doing it and blah 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 I was like, this isn't what I got into this work for. This really isn't what I got into this work for. And and me doing this would be me losing a part of myself, I think, and would be me um, kind of giving in to this, I I don't know, this this really giving into capitalism. It's almost like a sense of complicity, right? Um, Yeah. And that, yeah. Yeah, well, I want to say that it's so important what you're talking about. I think for, I think for young people, like, I'm not that old, right? I'm like super aging myself. I'm really not. I'm 37, (laughs) but it's true. When I was 22, we didn't have social media. So I have Mm. a different experience of being publicly seen than you do. My my life was at a different stage than than yours is now. My Mm. brain was developed differently than yours is now, right? There's so much that's different. Um, And it makes me think a lot about um, how especially when you're in work that puts you in the public light and people are sort of putting you on a pedestal and calling you the one, right? And mm. uh, and sort of really dehumanizing you because they're not mm. seeing you as this fallible, you know, imperfect person, but as this icon of mm. activism, you know, what that does to the self and how so often that trajectory of quote unquote, um, let's say visibility, that trajectory of visibility is very fast oftentimes, Mm -hmm. especially now, right? Because of the times we're in, the conversations around anti-racism, climate justice, um, Black Lives Matter, everything, right? That it's suddenly, okay, you're in the spotlight now, right? Do you know what you're doing? (laughs) Everyone's looking to you and it can be hard to do that check-in or to even know that it's necessary to do Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Um, So how do you, I mean, obviously it sounds like you're an incredible, incredibly self-reflective person and integrity sounds like it's a huge value of yours. Um, But how do you um, think about how, how you can have those, I guess, structures or things around you to make sure that you don't lose yourself? Like what do you Mm. put in place? Yeah, I think it's really difficult because even with myself, there's this fine line that I think I tread between self-reflection and self-deprecation which I think is quite difficult that sometimes I will and I think this is part of being so visible that I'll beat myself up so much about kind of not being perfect enough because with social social media people have access to you like they haven't had access to you in the past so if someone really doesn't like what I'm saying they can literally send me a message to tell me that and immediately like, immediately right and they might not have thought about it or reflected that much or they might not see me as a whole human and as silly as it is I will sometimes reflect on the what the bad messages so much more than I will the lovely nice ones that are encouraging um 
and so I think that in the times I think I'm feeling a bit too anxious and maybe getting too to the like self-deprecation and beating myself up I just take myself away from social media completely I do not read my dms I take some time away I drink some very calming tea I like just go offline for a while and re- remember who I am and and kind of remind myself of those kind of things and in those times I find that reflecting on the good the good things that can be done is really important but on the times when I think I can sometimes it's always actually I think both in both times when I'm also maybe my ego is going a bit too high I also I'm like maybe I need to take myself away from social right. media because I'm caring too much about like oh my gosh my photo got 10,000 likes wow I'm so cool right. like <laughs> and then I'm like that's not that's not something that I actually value and that mm. I actually deeply value and I think I'm just really blessed that um I also have people in my life who really hold me to my values in a really loving way um, and I think that's so important so Joe Becker who hosts the Yikes podcast with me she is just such a wonderful wonderful friend who holds me accountable in the most loving way but also is the person who I need to be when I if I need to call her and be like I think I'm having an existential crisis like social media it might be terrible she will have like be able to have like a real proper conversation where I know that she'll always always tell me the truth and always be honest but always be loving and encouraging and that she has the same goals in life that I do in the way of what we want to do with our lives and how we want to impact the world and so I think that having people around me is something that who really get it and like get what I want to do is important um but then reminding also always reminding myself of who I am and why I'm doing these things in the first place because like even the decision that I made recently like that was more me saying that rather than anyone else Mm. Um, and me reflecting on that rather than anyone else and I think that these are things like sometimes I just write down like what are my values and why am I doing these different things and I have that as a list and so I can check back sometimes if I'm trying to make a difficult decision and I'll be like does this conflict with my values Mm. and how I actually see myself and will this make me see myself differently because that's something that I don't really want to to do I don't want to lose because that's where I think I'd be losing myself um as I think just like having these solid values and solid friends and people around you who love you and care you but also care about climate justice and racial justice as well that's been like completely essential in my life I feel like this is um, such a masterclass for so many people because, again, um, you know, there is a lot that like the the planet is like there's crises, all all Mm -hmm. sorts of crises. Right. And people who are becoming called to inspired to step into some form of activism and are becoming more public about it. And again, like if you don't know who you are and if you don't have these practices of checking in and um, knowing what your values are or having key people in your life because we can feel like we're super connected to everyone on social media but do you have Mm -hmm. key people in your life who you know can call you on your bs Mm -hmm. or can tell you actually no you do need to like you know appreciate yourself for this right like you Mm -hmm. you need to stop self-deprecating and appreciate the work that you're doing um having things like that are are so important so I hope people are taking notes because I think these things apply regardless of age and regardless of where you are um sort of where you're entering into any kind of work um to do with social change it's very very important to stay centered I think and that's that's what I'm hearing from you yeah I like and also I think a big thing as well is I was really blessed that I was in therapy when my account kind of started to blow up Mm. um because I think that was something that I found to be really really essential to have a space where I could really talk about how this was making me feel and the impact of becoming quite visible was making me feel because it was yeah it is I think social media is is a tricky a tricky place in in many ways and for many reasons and being so visible is something that I think not enough people maybe checking on their mental health about a a lot because it is actually like something that does impact you if you're thinking there are literally thousands of people who look at me (laughs) and think things and if you think about that too much then you oh yeah you lose your mind right (laughs) yeah literally it's funny because you know today and you know I'll wrap this part up and we'll, we'll continue on but um it's funny because today I was just uh, finalizing a newsletter that I'd sent out today. And it's really interesting that even though I write, you know, this newsletter every week and have written a book, that's a bestseller and all of that. But every time I go to share something with someone, there's this little voice that comes up and goes, nobody, nobody cares what you have to say. (laughs) Nobody cares about what you have to write about. Like people think you're an idiot. Right. And it's like, Oh, that's still there. No, no, that's, Mm. that's still there. Right. And if you think about, um, 
especially as you know your account does blow up you know there are more people who are who have their eyeballs on you I mean the likelihood of that is is true that there mm. is <laughs> a large group of people who think you're an idiot right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and I think it's just making peace with that or just being like yeah that's cool yes <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> exactly all right so we've talked about um social media extensively but I think it was a really valuable conversation but you know it, it is the platform where I found you and um and you talk about many important issues on there so talk to us mm-hmm. about you know some of the issues that you talk about through social media and sort of make the link between them as well because there's a number of things that you're very very passionate about and people may say oh she does this right and that's over there and this is over there and that's over there but they're super hyper connected Mm. Um, so talk about that yeah I think that's um when I've had meetings about so people have been like so what's your message what's what's the core message I'm always like the core message is that all these issues are linked that's that's and that's what I want to do is show that all these different issues are linked so I talk principally, I think, about climate justice and racial justice, but I see like racial justice as climate justice. Yeah. So climate justice is a principle that basically sees um, that people and planet are connected and how systems of oppression impact people um, is also exacerbated by the climate crisis. And therefore, the climate, the climate crisis and tackling the climate crisis is also a social justice issue. So under that, we see racial injustice through environmental racism and things like that and how solutions to the climate crisis can also kind of tackle racism systemically and um, interpersonally and in so many different ways. Then we can move on to like migrant rights. And obviously that's also connected to racial injustice in so many ways. Um, But we can also improve migrant rights through a lens of climate justice if we try and create solutions to the climate crisis that also include migrants and also include asylum seekers and refugees. And we also realise that the climate crisis will exacerbate what we're seeing as current um, displacement. And we will see the it's going to be the biggest driver of um, forced migration that the world's ever seen. And how I got into all of these things was actually through this lens of of migrant rights and migrant justice, um, which is how I then got into climate justice things and all these other things um and then you can see these other issues like and I feel like I talk about a lot of a lot of different things like a wide range of things I talk about fast fashion as well and and I guess feminism under fast fashion um but the reality is that all of these issues are completely connected through the climate crisis and tackling all of these issues can be connected through um if we take a climate justice lens um also, I'm a medic, um, and I'm. Oh yeah, we didn't mention that, I'm right? Medical placements. She's a fourth year, so she's also a fourth I, I year always, medical student. No, I always forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but I always forget it. Like even just then, I was saying all these things, and I was like, "Oh, what else do I talk about?" And I was like, "Oh, my literal degree that I spent <laughs> most of my time doing." Um, but through, but through kind of this um, medical lens is how I've come to understand climate justice even better I think because when we look at everything through a health lens and through how health impacts people's lives um health is inherently obviously a social justice issue um there's a social determinants of health scholar called Hilary Graham who says that social inequalities um become written on the body as health inequalities and that's something that I always kind of come back to because the way in which people are oppressed through systems of oppression through Um, whether that's racism or transphobia or ableism or any or through how xenophobia towards migrants and things like that how people are are impacted by these different systems of oppression um, also impacts their health and it also manifests itself in the health of different individuals Mm -hmm. Um, and we see that through um, the health experience by refugees and asylum seekers who have worse health outcomes we see that through black women's um, maternal mortality rates which are like ridiculously like so in the in the UK it's you're five times more likely to die in childbirth if you're a black woman whereas in 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 the and in the US you're three times more likely to die in childbirth if you're a black woman and I I did some research around that in my degree my global health policy degree last year um in which I focus on climate justice and I think that we just need to see all of these issues as connected and that's caring about all of these issues and kind of yeah being moved by all of them it doesn't have to um dilute any of our movements at all I think if anything it strengthens them um there's a quote by Audre Lord um which says that we can't have single issue struggles because we don't live single issue lives mm. and that's something that I always come back to as well because yeah I think sometimes it can be 
people can say like you just need one clear message like one clear thing that you're talking about you should only care about one thing like the climate crisis is bad enough we can't care about racial injustice or we can't care about migrant rights but actually caring about all these things and being aware of them will only ever strengthen our work um, and it will only ever make our work better for all people and so why would we ever avoid that and why would we keep away from that I think it's just like if we're not aware of oppression then we're not going to be able to resist it we'll just mm. be upholding it and so that's why I think through yeah I'll talk about like trans rights issues in the UK and I'll talk about migrant rights issues and I'll talk about racial injustice a lot of my own experiences of medical racism and and the climate crisis because all of these things are linked mm. and I know that even saying that that might even sound quite overwhelming to people who are like oh my gosh there's so many things going on in the world but it's actually really hopeful because in the way that if we tackle things through this lens of climate justice we do have the possibility of making a better world um in the Lancet in their climate change and health report they said that in their kind of earlier one, they said that the climate crisis is the greatest global health threat. Um, but then they changed it in 2015 to say that the climate crisis is the great greatest global health opportunity, because if we tackle it in a way that centers social justice and centers climate justice, then the co-benefits that arise also tackle all these other social determinants of health. So they wow. also tackle racial injustice. They also tackle um, the injustice faced by migrants and all these different things. And I was just like, I remember reading that, that report and I was like, oh, this is so hopeful and actually wow. wonderful that if if we do look at all these things as connected, that's how we can create a better world for all of us. That's amazing. Um, I had never heard that before, you know, and, you know, I obviously talk about how all of these systems are connected, but this is the first time I've heard about how actually tackling the climate crisis will sort of open this big door to all the others, um, the other systems. Um, so what are, um, I guess, what are the, the solutions? Like other mm -hmm. than, because I think oftentimes we hear about, oh, here's the things that you do as an individual, right? Uh, don't don't buy from fast fashion or, you know, recycle or, you know, those kind of things. But what actually is required for real change and how can just everyday people be a part of that? Yeah, I think it just requires us to be active citizens. So I see being an activist I know that there's a lot of conversation about what does it mean to be an activist but I just see being an activist as just being an active citizen so you don't have to call yourself an activist you just have to be actively involved in the world around us so that means being aware of these kind of different issues that exist and especially when it comes to the climate crisis look around your area and see how you see um, environmental impacts impacting your community even just directly around you um, things that have co-benefits are things like increased green, green spaces. So that's also a climate solution um, is having increased access to green spaces. And that improves people's health in so many different ways. So maybe maybe you live, maybe someone who's listening lives in an area that has access to green spaces there, but then you know that the area next to you um, doesn't have green spaces. Um, you could be involved in like even campaigning in your local council to try and have access to green spaces there. Maybe it's, I think I just want to move away from this idea of, um, of just it being about individual action because I feel like anyone who's yes. listening will know the kind of individual action things they'll be like oh right. maybe I should cut down on like maybe I should have more of a um, plant-based diet maybe I should cycle to work and things that people know these things already I kind of think people know that fast fashion isn't ideal at all for human rights or for the environment but we all need to move away from it just being about us as an individual and think of it as like a systems problem and how can we influence systems and how can we have an impact on those um and that means yeah coming together and whether it is like rallying within our local councils or if it's just putting pressure on these bigger institutions and these big businesses because businesses like the fossil fuel companies that have caused this crisis and known that this crisis has been happening for a really really long time and if people want to listen more about that um the drilled podcast it's a true crime podcast about the climate crisis which kind of shows how much the fossil fuel industry is known for a really long time is that um, the, the drilled drilled it's called yes. drilled okay. with amy westervelt um and it's really really great but the fossil fuel industry want you to think it's your problem as you as an individual and it's and they want you to waste your time not i'm not saying all of this is a waste of time they want you to waste your time maybe driving to 10 different stores to get plastic free groceries rather than maybe using some of that same time to write to your government or rally against con uh, corporations or work together in community to organize um so I think that that's why I think organizing is is so important um and getting involved with people in your community um to put pressure on like 
and I think the campaigns can be so vast and so creative like there are so many different campaigns that I've been able to support and things like that but there's a campaign just as an example now of these um three um black and latinx and oh no, just black and latinx um youth in the uk who are basically suing the uk government under right to life so they're saying that the uk government is um kind of preventing their right to life and their right to family life of their family who uh, still live in countries that are going to be more impacted by the climate crisis mm. and they're doing it through this kind of legal lens of like how could we try and set a precedent to be able to take legal action against a government around these different things but part of that campaign is also like how do we reach um black the black community how do we reach communities of color in the uk how do we show people that this is our issue too mm. um and i think that's like a kind of like a different way that i hadn't actually thought of approaching these issues before but the main things i'm trying to say is just organize join join with people organizing just means people coming together and like rallying together behind a cause so we all have so much power to do that and maybe if you're using your energies right now to like make loads of different oat milk like i don't know just making loads of like spending loads of time on things that do take quite a long time i'm not trying to completely discourage people from doing that but i also think that there's just too much focus on that and actually we only have a limited amount of energy in this world and we need to think about how can we use that in the best way and how can we direct our energy towards the kind of best solutions or to creating more solutions as well yeah wow that's that's really great and i i think um you know sometimes i think those individual things that we've heard about know about are sort of easy to do right like they're okay i know how to do this or that's easy it's convenient for me to do but it's inconvenient um i mean even outside of let's say we weren't in a global pandemic and we could all meet <laughs> together publicly um you know we won't we won't necessarily right because it's inconvenient it, and, and and the inconvenience i think is also that these um uh solutions or these ideas or these actions aren't guaranteed to give that instant feeling of gratification that we've achieved something mm-hmm. right like I remember I watched a really powerful video of you at the Extinction Extinction Rebellion protests in London. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell our listeners about that? You would change yourself (laughs) um, to a stage and it was heartbreaking to watch. Yeah, I think that was one of the most emotional experiences of my entire life. And I think I, I was sometimes it doesn't it doesn't feel real that it happened. And I watched that video of me because that video was taken, I think, at midnight. And I'd been crying a lot during that day. So basically for context, um, I think it was two years ago now, in October, um, I went down to London to join in with the October Rebellion, with Extinction Rebellion Scotland, um, which I was involved with then. I was on the media team. I did media and social media stuff for them and spokesperson trainings and things like that. And I'd said before going down, I'm a medical student. I can't get arrested. This like I, I definitely can't put myself in that position because... I could be really compromising my future and basically when we got there um, and I think that day I had been reading a reading of the IPCC report so that's the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and they basically create they create reports on what the impacts of warming will be on the world Mm. and the 1.5 degrees warming report um, it basically talks about the impact of 1.5 degrees of warming post the industrial era so and ba- the the impacts of 1.5 degrees of warming are completely catastrophic. So I read the part about um, coral reefs and um, rising sea levels. And I'm I love scuba diving. That's actually like my favorite thing in the world. If we were in a world where there were no issues, I'd be scuba diving all day, every day. Um, and reading the bit about coral reefs and just reading about how within my lifetime coral reefs will be completely gone if we don't take r- like really drastic action on climate. Um, it was really moving to me and I it was it was just like a reading of this out loud and people were reading it all day and I remember George Monbiot read after me which I was really honored by um but I started crying like a lot about coral I was just really crying a lot because I was really moved by it and in that same day um they needed more people to lock on so locking on is just like gluing yourself or chaining yourself to infrastructure in the camp so that it stops police from moving the camp on so we'd been at our camp for a couple of days i've been camping in a tent in the outside of westminster abbey in the road for a couple of days and we managed to keep our camp for quite a long time we were quite quite happy about it and i just got a text from one of my friends like they're trying to demolish the camp we need someone to lock on you'd mentioned that you might 
think about it like are you okay to do it and I just remember being like I'm like this is such a huge issue and I can't and I actually do have privilege and I hold privilege in so many ways and if I can use that privilege um to help to help us keep our camp for a bit longer to help us carry on um talking about this issue and keeping it um in the news and in the headlines then I'm going to do that and I remember just like chaining myself on really really quickly and Mm. it was just a big blur and it was when I actually locked on um and my arm was I was chained um in this it's like a metal arm tube and with this really really lovely like elderly man called John who had come down from the Scottish Highlands and we were locked together for like 10 hours so we got to know each other fairly well um but I actually started hysterically crying um just because I realized that like I was that I wasn't sure if I wanted to have children anymore not because of the kind of weird eco-fascisty reasons but because I was like do I want to bring a child into a world where we have to chain ourselves to metal tubes right next to parliament in order to be listened to about a crisis which is going to impact all of us and which already is killing so many people Mm -hmm. do I do I want to to do that and this was like a big thing for me because I'd always wanted I've always wanted to have kids I'm still not sure but in that moment I just felt really overwhelmed by the gravity of the situation that we were having to go to ex- like ex- almost extremes like this right. um in order to be heard like it is an it is an extreme this was a, it was a last resort I didn't want to chain myself to a tube I didn't want to end up in a police cordon in the middle of the night with a mm. police officer telling me why the police aren't racist even though I didn't ask um <laughs> it was like I know I know it was like the one of the most it was a, it was a very wow. like definitely a very traumatizing experience yeah. in the end I didn't end up getting I didn't end up getting arrested because I think I was a bit of a mess and they were like we don't like they we don't, we'd already lost the sight by that point they the police had said to us they were really manipulative with our they did a very like good cop bad cop kind of thing of and they and we were just like we actually don't they were like we're not we're going to leave you here until 6 a.m um unless you unlock now and it was like I think it was like midnight or one in the morning and we just made a decision that the the cat the site was lost and we unlocked and all of us just uh, it was actually John the elderly man and um another guy they stayed until six in the morning wow because they were just like we're gonna make these officers stand here all night if they're gonna be like this with you guys but you don't don't have to stay Um, and they got sawn out I think at six um but it was a really emotional emotional time um because I think it just made me realize the extent and and that happened two years ago and still we haven't seen drastic action on climate and that was obviously like there and and it's not just us that have done these actions these actions have been going on all over the world and we are not and we I'm not no longer a part of Extinction Rebellion for many reasons but Extinction Rebellion weren't the people to start direct action on climate we indigenous youth have been chaining themselves to pipelines for so long like indigenous people have been literally giving their lives for this um for this fight for so much longer um and yet we still haven't seen change and we st- and it's kind of like how what what do we have to do to be listened to about a mm. crisis which is affecting all of us mm. um yeah so how, so so in in those moments of um because that i mean obviously that's a very traumatizing thing to have to go through and to have to do that and still not be listened to and two years later right still very little action and knowing that actually people have been doing actions such as yours and even more Mm. for so long and still so little headway has been made other than greenwashing campaigns and Mm -hmm. people giving lip service and um that that sort of thing so what well do you pull from um how do you like continue to reinvigorate yourself refill yourself so that you don't slip into a sense of apathy Mm. and helplessness and hopelessness um, that you keep moving forward knowing the reality of this this sort of slow progress that's being made Mm. I think I always look to the past to learn from and how social media movements have worked in the past because being a defeatist is as bad as being a like and being in denial of these issues um and so I can't even let myself get to the, a point of apathy I just don't really let myself get there because I just realized that yeah if you don't if you stop caring about something you're as bad as denying it's there because you're just you're not doing anything either way mm. um so I think I get really um inspired by just looking at 
old activists, like people who are like much yes. older and been doing this this for a long time. And this Good is one ancestors, thing actually, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, like, um, I think about how Angela Davis has been doing this work for over fifty years, and that's half a century. <laughs> if yeah. she can do this work for half a century and have seen what she has seen, and she can carry on going then so can I too. And there must be hope somewhere. And I think I just trust in people. Yeah. And people who've been doing this work for such a long time and haven't give up, I'm given up. I'm like, if they can't lose hope, then how dare I? Like if, if they can keep going, then how dare I? Like I my yeah, my, my ancestors, they didn't lose hope, even though they went through unimaginable traumas and hardship and they went through unimaginable and unimaginable things and they still kept going and they still, and there, there, there always was hope then. So there must be hope now. And that there always must be something that we can move towards because I think hope is hope is like an active stance it's like a it's choosing to do things I think it's something you to. choose right I think it's something yeah. that you choose not something that you wait for no and that's something I really want people to stop waiting for other people to give them hope and just be the hope yourself and do yeah. something like I think hope is action and hope is is beautiful in that way in that we can create it ourselves um and that's why I think that's that's part of the reason I act is because I found that in when I'm acting on things, when I'm acting on the climate crisis, that's when I feel more hope because I am being that hope. Mm. In the times when I wasn't doing as wasn't wasn't involved as much in organizing, those were the times when I would be lying awake in the middle of the night and could not like and couldn't move because I was just thinking about the peril of the climate crisis because I was like held in fear then. When actually when I've started to act, even though I've become more aware of the impacts, I have more hope because I know that I am doing something about it and that I am part of that movement and, I'm, and movements are what create change. And that's what I think inspires me so much and keeps me going. And if, if anyone's looking for hope, you can just be that. You can just do something in order to kind of create that. Oh, it's amazing. Thank you. Yes. Yes. A thousand times. Yes. Um, okay. So I am really curious how you balance <laughs> being a medical student of all things <laughs> and all of these other incredible things that you do. I mean, we, we, we've we mentioned a couple of times that you also host a podcast, which as a podcaster, podcasting is a full-time job. Um, and I am constantly looking at how can I do this thing that I love? I love doing it. Mm. but give priority to writing, which is my first vocation. <laughs> right? And so, and so that's two things that I'm trying to balance, right? Writing and podcasting or speaking, um, and then home life and just giving me my time, Layla time. Mm. Um, how do you, how do you balance it? Or what does a practice of balance look like for you? So, I'm not sure if I always balance this well. So I just want to preface all of this with that is that I'm sure <laughs> that I definitely give myself too much to do a lot of the time and then end up having to rejig things. But I think a way that's helped me do all of these things is there was one time when I was talking to Jo, who I who I co-host um, Yikes with, and I was saying to her like, oh my gosh, this is all really overwhelming. Loads of other medics just get to do medicine and health stuff and they don't have to do anything else and I'm doing all these other things and sometimes it can be really overwhelming. And she actually checked me and she was like, everything else that you're doing is health work too. The anti-racism work that you do, that improves health. The climate work that you do, that will improve health in so many way more ways, like probably even more ways than I'll be able to improve health by practicing medicine as a doctor. Like all of this work that you're doing is health work. And so if you see it like that, you are making your patients' lives and hopefully people you might even never meet lives better by doing this oh. work. And I think seeing it through that perspective has made me just see that kind of in the same way that I see all these other issues are connected, like my, my, all these different kind of areas of my work, they're also connected as well. And I think that's what kind of, that helps me have the motivation to do everything. And it helps me make time for things and prioritize things in a better way. Um, but I, do, I definitely do get overwhelmed sometimes. I think that having medicine as a almost side thing or extra thing <laughs> actually does. Oh yeah, as does. a medical student, right. <laughs> but it's, it's quite nice because I find that when I'm studying about the human body and about medicine and things, it helps me to almost have some sort of escape from the rest mm. of my work because I am focusing on science and just learning things. Right. And that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And 
and that's actually really nice like it's I, I think I might actually find all of this stuff more overwhelming if it's all I did because yeah. then I would there, there's almost like a never-ending amount of of work that I could do for example on the podcast there's a never ending amount of preparation that you That's could right. do for a podcast episode. There's there's never like a an end to that. Or even with like when I'm writing things, there's never ending amount of editing that I could do or when I'm doing a speaking event like this. And I think that it's actually helped having medicine as a thing because it helps me say no a lot. I say no to a lot of things and I've learned to say no to a lot because that's a way of kind of retaining some sort of like brain space and yes. a way. And I think that it's actually, it's kind of helped during everything that's been going on to us be like if someone's being really harassing I'll just be like I'm actually a medical student in a pandemic like please leave me alone <laughs> please leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> and it's made it a lot easier but it's also been it's been good to like yeah have something else to focus my time on I also don't really know how I do it but I also I just think my brain goes really really fast which is more that means that it can be more stressful when I'm not doing things mm. because my brain just races so like right. I listen to all my lectures and all my and all podcasts like on a two times speed and <laughs> my friends have sometimes been like what are you listening to they're like I can't even understand that and I was just like that's <laughs> the speed of my brain so I can't like any slower than I can get a bit bored sometimes <laughs> so I think I just I think it's a blessing and a curse that my brain just whizzes and whirs um but it's helpful in this kind of space but then at the same time I've had to really check myself and make sure that I'm not over glorifying being busy and taking on loads of stuff right as this kind of manifestation of internalized capitalism of being like I have to be busy all the time I have to be productive right um and actually giving myself space to be like I need rest too mm. I need to have time to I don't need to fill every single hour of my day mm. with a different work thing I actually can allow myself rest and to read books that aren't serious as well as books that are very serious right yeah oh my gosh with the books I mean I I know I have to like um sometimes because I read so much because I interview so many authors and obviously because I write so I research a lot but it's like okay can I just read like a book that's about I don't know (laughs) a dragon or something you know there's nothing There's no system of oppression. There's no, there's nothing there that makes me think about my work and makes me want to go write some notes or write a, an Instagram post about it. Right. Mm. Um, it's, it's very important to create that space. Yeah, definitely. I've been, um, so one thing that I do when I'm a bit overwhelmed is read like a not that good YA novel okay. um, because like a deliberately not- <laughs> like, <laughs> but, like a deliberately like quite terrible one that I like I won't that I won't share I would never share to anyone that I'm reading it because I'd probably be a bit embarrassed <laughs> but I was watching I was reading this one that was like a post-apocalyptic London but it was just so random and weird but it was it was like about zombies and stuff but it wasn't connected to anything and it wasn't serious in any way and it just made me laugh at how ridiculous some of the storylines were but that's why I think there's such a place for books that are just like silly and there's something for everyone right? and just lets you switch off like this book was definitely written for like 13 year old boys but I loved it I loved it so much because I could completely escape I wasn't there was nothing to really inspire me to like think about how this connects to all these different other issues it was just like <laughs> this is a bit of a silly book and I've been enjoying reading it I <laughs> love that <laughs> okay so as as we wrap up I'm really curious um you know what are you sort of visioning or seeing for yourself post your studies um where do you self where do you see yourself going obviously you've said everything is interconnected for you it's all connected but where do you see yourself taking it what would you like to do that is a great question um I'm currently grappling with this a lot. We actually had some, today's um, uni for me was careers advice, which was, I was like, oh dear, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, And it was talking about the different kind of paths that you can go down through medicine. I think for me, ideally, I would like to do part-time medicine. So be a, I still want to get qualified. I would still love to practice medicine because this is something that I've wanted to do my whole life. And a big part of that is I want to be kind of the black woman doctor that I wish I'd had um and Mm. I want to be able to be that for some other little girl who doesn't feel represented or doesn't see themselves in a doctor like I kind of want to be that um and I do enjoy medicine to some extent um and I enjoy the social aspects of medicine so much I think I'd love to be to do like part-time general practice where I kind of could get to know a community in some way Mm. as part of it so that's the medical side of it and then I think I would like to write as much as possible I really love writing and 
whilst I was thinking of doing a a book thing more recently I am delaying all of that until post studies because I wanted to give it the best um that I could give it so I'm hoping that post-graduation I'll I'll write my first book which would be very exciting um that is exciting and, and I can't yeah. wait to read it yes <laughs> yeah so I almost I almost said yes to, a, to book stuff a couple months ago and then I actually chose it was a big moment of me choosing myself instead and being like I actually want to be able to balance my life and I think that adding writing a book on top of everything else um right now might be a bit much so I just like I'm going to take my time with that and I'm hoping that I could possibly be part-time doctor still be able to do speaking work and still be able to do kind of like the organizing and things that I really love and writing that I really love um but try and balance those things together and I think that I just see myself in the future just still being part of community organizing whatever kind of way that I could be useful Mm. um and like trying to support movements and I'm really hoping that we're in a better space with climate justice and that by that point we'll still we'll still be pushing people on but um hopefully we'll be in a better place in general in the world um but I don't ever really see myself stopping doing this work I just can't imagine not doing it and not talking about these things and not working in community and not kind of being a part of all of that um but I just want to see how I can balance it I don't really know like I this is another thing is that I'm also especially I think the pandemic has taught all of us that you can't plan things that well right. like you right. can't I I can't know where I'm going to be in when do I graduate 2023 mm. um I've still got a long way to go sadly <laughs> it's a long degree um but I'm just thinking I'm just taking things as they come and thinking like what would I love to do like I would I would love to be able to write as much as I want and do speaking things you, and, you said something yeah. so key though you said it was um when you were receiving I guess book offers or ideas mm-hmm. or writing a book um that it was this big moment of choosing yourself what did you mean by that because I found that uh, that really resonated with me mm, I think it's because so I think I have got into this mindset which I think a lot of people who hold marginalized identities um do get into this kind of scarcity mindset of things are only going to be here now Mm -hmm. and so you've got to take them Mm -hmm. um, and you've got to run with them because you don't want to lose out on all these different things right um and when I was and that we can like carry it all right that Mm -hmm. we're these super Mm -hmm. people who can just do it all and and not break yeah exactly and I think that when I was offered book things and talking to different agents and publishers and things um I was very much in this mindset of, well, I I can just add that onto my life as it is now. Like I can just remove the time that I currently use to rest and sleep (laughs) and (laughs) and I can just write a book. (laughs) And, um, and I think that in me saying, yeah, in me saying no to that, I was saying yes to myself in the way that I was saying, I value being happy and content and, and finding joy. I value that as much as I do maybe this kind of, um, like exterior success of mm. of having written a book at a young age or those kind of things like mm. I actually value my own timeline more than I do the timeline of other people that are trying to kind of dictate that to me and I also trust in God a lot that God's going to be like you know what like that I'll know it deep in my soul when it's the right time to do things yes. because the Lord will just tell me that it is yeah and I think that that's kind of in that situation it's really hard to do because like mm. obviously people in my family were just like take it do it do it yeah, take right. it yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah like this could be the start of of so many different things but I just think I'm trying to step into this like mindset of abundance rather than scarcity and being like things will always be there and if you want them to be and if they're the right thing they'll always be there and not rushing into things um and not compromising my joy if I don't like I don't think I should have to compromise my joy for quote-unquote success like that's not mm-hmm. and I'm defining success myself and success to me means being like happy and feeling joy and yeah. not just these kind of external markers of having done this or yeah or monetary wealth or these kind of things I'm trying to define it myself um which sometimes is scary because that means yes. that means like resisting a lot of the things that you're taught a lot but I'm just trying to trust myself a lot um and value myself enough to trust my own advice as well. Well, I think, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Audre Lorde, and I think that she would be super proud hearing that because, <laughs> you know, we she talked about, you know, we have to define ourselves for ourselves and mm. that we have to know, like, what, what it is that we want to do because if we don't, other people have plans for us, mm. right? And often those plans are to their benefit and to our detriment. And so um, if we're not clear on you said, you know, what my timeline is, Mm. what I want it to be on my timeline, not what other people's timelines are. 
Um, and having that trust in a higher power, you know, I think is, is, is very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And also in yourself, right? If I want to write a book, I can write a book. I just don't have to do it right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because I think that part of me, when I was turning it down, part of it was, I was saying to myself, like, am I turning it down? Because I don't think I can do it. Mm. And I was like, no, I could write a great book. Like, I, I know I could, like, mm. I know I could do that. And it's not about me not thinking I can do it. It's about me choosing when I wanted to do it and, right. and choosing my own like, joy. And that's something that I talked to my friends about at the time, actually, who, yeah. especially chatting out joe so many times because she's just a great pal but she sounds she was also, amazing yeah, i think no, everyone she, who's listening to this wants to be her friend now <laughs> she is literally the best and she was saying she was like you know you could write a great book you know it'd be amazing but she was like but if you if this isn't if this doesn't feel completely right for you then mm. you've got to listen to yourself and you've got to do like what you think is right um and i think having someone also be like supportive in that way and kind of echo back what i thought i believed um was was really kind of useful as well um and yeah just remembering that things will things will be here if, if they're meant to be right and that what and I also want to be here and I also want to be here as a whole and healthy human a, yes. and through all of this um yeah not with your joy completely depleted and your sense mm -hmm. of um um yeah just wholeness and wellness you know uh because mm. writing a book is is hard it's hard <laughs> yeah and I, and I think what you were saying about um it for being for someone else's benefit because a lot of um, people that I spoke to in publishing and things like that, they were really keen to get it out quickly because people suddenly care about racism and they suddenly care That's about right. climate stuff. It was like, get it out quickly, get a big deal and blah, blah. And I realized like, actually, I want to take my time with this. Like this is something yeah. that I think requires and deserves time. And so instead I'm going to write this on my own timeline. Like I'm like, I'm going to write, I still, I, I write all the time, but I'm just going to keep writing for myself and when it feels like okay this is the time to put this out there and this is the time then 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 that'll be okay rather than it being because something has happened in the world that means people suddenly care it should be more about like how does how do I feel about this instead and this is um and we'll, we'll sort of close on this point but this is something that I feel very strongly about because you know post the 2020 um uh, Black Lives Matter protests and the sudden catapulting right of people mm. into anti-racism work or at least an interest in it mm -hmm. um that was something that i was super aware of it was the ways in which the media and publishing companies and um, just companies would want to latch on to black people um and say now we're going to offer you all of these things but we but give it to us next month right <laughs> yeah, yeah literally yeah you know and, and it's incredible i mean um it's it's still wanting it's 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 tokenism mm -hmm. it's you know performative allyship it's white saviorism it's all of those things that people think are allyship or think as being part of this movement for change, but they're actually just replicating, you know, oppression over and over again. And mm. I just want to say this to any companies, publishers, media, you know, people listening, like we, we are clocked on to you. We are very mm. aware of um, the game and we're mm. also very aware of our value. And, you know, for any black people, indigenous people, people of color, I want to remind them, be aware of your value. And like Michaela has said, right? Like, you can do anything you want, anything mm -hmm. you want. You are brilliant. You can do anything you want. Do it on your timeline and do it from a place mm -hmm. of feeling whole and feeling well and feeling like your joy is there. Michaela, you're such an amazing example of that. And I just want to say thank you because those decisions made in private, right? Nobody knows that these are things that you are thinking about. Um, they matter. They really, really matter. Um, not selling ourselves out, not selling ourselves short and, and staying true. Um, to our own values and to the values of, of, of true change is, is so mm. important. So thank you. No worries. <laughs> thank you so much. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what to say. I was like, there's so many lovely things that have just been said. I don't know how to react. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to, first of all, I just want to say just to, you know, again, pile on compliments and thank yous, but this has been such a great conversation. I really think this has been a masterclass for so many people. Um, and it, I just can't wait to see, you know, how you continue on your journey. Like it's, it's amazing. And, and thank you for, um, the issues that you are bringing to light for those of us who are not in that area of work or who are not, um, 
you know, that well versed in in those mm -hmm. um, in what's happening, um, but also in just how you hold yourself as well. So it's a real example. And I know you do it for you. You don't do it for other people. But, um, you know, you talked about how you look to how other older activists, you know, how they go on their journey and it mm -hmm. mattered to you. And so you matter to people who are looking at you too. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Leo. That's honestly, I feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> emotional. I just honestly, I've, I've loved this conversation so much and it's been, yeah, I, I will think about this a lot as well as I go through the rest of the week. Like this has been a complete blessing. Oh, thank you. Okay. So our final question, Michaela, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? So I think it just means many things, but it means checking in on where the actions of my ancestors have caused like good in the world and how I can learn from that, but also learning, looking at how that my ancestors might have caused harm in the world and how I might be upholding that harm. Mm. And how can I honor not only those who have kind of come before me, but those who will come after me in how I present myself and how I hold myself in the world and how I direct my heart in this world and how I direct my actions and just constantly checking myself on those things and constantly reminding myself of those things um and constantly just holding space um for how I see the world to be completely challenged because if I look at how the world that my ancestors lived in it was completely different from the world is today so I wonder what the world would be in however long from now and I I hope that whoever comes after me will be able to look back and think that I'd learn from things and that they can learn from me in some different ways. Um, um, and that we can all learn from each other and be moved by each other. Um, I think being a good ancestor is also just like allowing yourself to be soft um, and being soft is so many different things. It means being soft to um, be able to be moved by other people's actions, but also being soft with yourself um, and realizing that we can't know everything and we'll never know everything. Um, and all we can do is as much as we can and take rest and allow ourselves to be like soft within that um and that reminds me of, I wrote this poem called soft black girl which I really love and it, that's what I try and see myself as I'm just like I'm just a soft black girl and I'm just trying to do my best I love that that's beautiful thank you Michaela no worries thank you so much for having me this is Leila Saad and you've been listening to Good Ancestor Podcast I hope this episode has helped you find deeper answers on what being a good ancestor means to you We'd love to have you join the Good Ancestor podcast family over on Patreon, where subscribers get early access to new episodes, patron-only content and discussions, and special bonuses. Join us now at patreon.com forward slash Good Ancestor podcast. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being a good ancestor.